unbelievable story out of New York this week. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with it at this point because the video has been so viral. Jose Alba is a clerk at a bodega in New York City. It's called the Blue Moon Convenience Store. He was attacked by somebody who started a fight with Alba because his girlfriend's, uh, I think it was an EBT card, didn't work when she was trying to buy a bag of chips. Cards declined. The boyfriend comes in, starts attacking Alba. As you can see on the viral video, you saw the, the picture of it in that headline. Alba stabbed the man who attacked him to death. He was sent to Rikers Island on an exceedingly high bail. I think it was like a quarter of a million dollars. It was then dropped to $50,000, and he's, he's now out. Um, but it's fairly outrageous the way I think the prosecutor uh, reacted to this. There is video. Um, it, he had a complete right to defend himself in this case. Uh, GoFundMe took the page down because of the violence in it, there is a give, send, go. Ryan, what is your take on this whole horrible situation? I mean, it, it is awful no matter how you look at it. Um, a man died, a man had to take a life in defense of himself, um, went to, to Rikers Island, is now being charged. What do you make of it? And there are a lot of different layers to it. I mean, from a, from a bail reform perspective, it, it puts uh, you know a lot of conservatives in, an, in an, a in a difficult position because they've they've been railing against bail reform over the last several years. I, I happen to think that this I don't think that this uh, store owner is a further danger to society. I don't think he's the kind of person that needs some uh, you know prohibitive uh, bail to keep him locked up. Uh, I think that the, the, the prosecutor said that he had a, a pre-planned trip to the Dominican Republic and so Therefore, he was a, a flight risk. I, I don't think that's fair. I think people travel. Uh, I, you know, I, so I think that th uh, that people are right to criticize the, the the bail level, and he should, you know, he should be able to get out, and, and I suspect he will uh, face trial. I think the whole the whole thing is tragic, and obviously everybody supports a a right to defend yourself. The the, the question of uh, a lethal. Um, a lethal response uh, in an escalation you know he obviously you know he was the one who was attacked he's and as he's trying to get out you can see uh, the the victim then kind of uh, grab him mm -hmm. and that's when he starts stabbing him uh, he doesn't necessarily know whether or not the the person is armed and so you can understand his his uh, his fear and if if he was a police officer you know, this would be absolutely an open and open and shut case. Um, I, but I, I just, I don't, I also don't want to get into a place where everybody who gets into a fight or gets confronted, you know, aut automatically has the legal right to then kill the other person. I think that that takes us to, to a dangerous place, though I know uh, probably most people disagree with me on that. You know, I think there's a question of whether it's intentional in a moment where you're trying to protect your life. And that's a, an important element. And, and uh, Alba's son has spoken to that. He said he's this, he was terrified. He's an elderly man. He's 61 years old being attacked mm -hmm. by a much younger, bigger, stronger man. So you can understand how in the moment it would completely trigger survival uh, reflex. And I mean, as it should, and as he should have the right to do. But there, yeah, I agree that bail, on a bail reform level, it puts conservatives in an interesting place. And frankly, it's not an issue that conservatives pay a ton of attention to. And I think when things like this happen, you can get you know some common ground uh, out of tragedy, unfortunately, because it, it brings attention to it. Um, and, and on the other hand, though, I do think with the rates of violent crime increasing in certain areas of this country, many major city, cities have seen increases in violent crime. That's not true across the board. Um, and it's not true that all crime has increased everywhere. There is nuance to this. But in certain major cities, they are seeing spikes in things like armed robbery. It is important for people like Alba to know that they can defend themselves. And on the flip side, it's important for people who do attack those like Alba, who want to start fights with people like Alba, to know that there's a deterrent um, in place, that this is, you know, people are not going to be charged with murder when you have on video camera um, scenes of, of violence being perpetrated against them. So I, I also do understand, Ryan, why this seems to have resonated with a lot of people around the country. Viral give, send, go, viral video, lots of coverage of it. 
um, because I think people are genuinely worried about violent crime in their communities and, and want to know that they'd be comfortable, I guess, acting. Yeah, and it's, it's really hard to put yourself in somebody's shoes because you, you don't know, you know what they're feeling in that particular moment. Uh, it, it's, a, it's really tough. It, it, there, there is, a, there is a, there's a, a risk that you know, if, if, you, if you open up self-defense laws too dramatically, that you're going to have people take advantage of it. That yes. you're, yeah. you're, going, you're going to have people uh, who, who start fights uh, and then uh, when the fight starts, then they're going, then they're going to uh, you know, use deadly force against, against the person and say, look, I was just, I was defending myself. Now that is not, that's not what that's not what happened here. Uh, so, th but then you go back to the question: Well, what if what if that is what happened here? What, you know, what if he had say pushed somebody first, uh, and and then and then does that then you know close off the self defense, or do, or does he still have the self defense right? I think these are thornier questions than we'd like to acknowledge, and I guess that's why juries are you know uh, you know oftentimes appropriate to to work these out. You put the put the facts before them and and let let a jury of your peers kind of, you know, sort, sort it out. I think Alba is really lucky in this case that there was surveillance footage um, because the, that's what mounted the sort of public backlash, which got his charge reduced and got his bail reduced. And actually, as part of his release agreement, Alba is also barred from leaving New York City and he had to surrender his passport. Simon's girlfriend, the man that attacked Alba and was stabbed, allegedly also pulled a knife from her purse and stabbed Alba three times in the shoulder and hand. According to his attorney, she has not been charged with the DA's office saying mm. only, quote, we are continuing to to review the evidence and the investigation is ongoing. So continuing to the, review the evidence, a perfectly fair statement. Um, but again, there's been this backlash against progressive prosecutors, um, progressive activists basically in DA's offices, whether it's Chesa Boudin in San Francisco, wherever it is, or here, Alvin Bragg in New York City. Um, that's going to be, I, I think that's going to be a real problem for Democrats because to your point, Ryan, there's absolutely a flip side to this coin. You don't want laws that are so open-ended that people take advantage of them. Um, on the other other hand, though, you have to have, if, if rates of violent crime are, are increasing, people need deterrence. They need to know that they will be, um, you know, people will defend themselves and they will be legally within their rights to do that. So to your point, this is, this is the, a thorny issue, but I don't think this particular example, I wonder how you think this plays into that yeah. conversation about broad, more broadly progressive prosecutors. Yeah, and I actually had missed that his that his girlfriend had a knife and had and had stabbed him, and I think that that knowing that, I think that that makes the situation a lot clearer because now, you know, he's he's seeing a, a deadly weapon also being deployed in a violent way uh, against him, which at, can could which could have easily you know led to him being killed. Uh, so I think that does kind of pull it out of some of that gray area into a into a clearer self defense uh, picture. Uh, you know, I don't on the on the bigger question. I, I I think that you know crime is is always going to you know cause problems for the kind of incumbent political party. Uh, there was a, a a huge amount of media attention on the fact that Chase Boudin uh, you know lost lost that recall, but up and down California at at that same time, uh, progressive prosecutors you know were either reelected or or ousted kind of law and order prosecutors. Uh, elsewhere around the country and in places you wouldn't have expected. You saw, I think, in De uh, Des Moines, for instance, at, at, right around that, that same night, elected a progressive you know, uh, criminal justice reform prosecutor. And so I think there is actually still a lot of appetite for criminal justice reform. The, the you know, if, if the approach that we've been taking since the 1980s of, of mass incarceration was, was what go was going to get us out of this uh, you know, out of this situation was was the answer. Uh, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in. And I think some people, you know, enough people are recognizing that that you're still going to have a live de debate despite a, an uptick in, in a lot of places in violent crime. Yeah, and the specifics on that are, um, this is from the New York Post, a total of 189 murders have been tallied in New York City as of Sunday, the latest date of available data, this is for June. That's down more than 13%, actually, from 218 on the same date a year ago, but rapes, robberies, and felony assaults are all up 15.4%, 39.7%, and 19.6%, respectively. You can see this also repeated in Washington, D.C., and L.A. These are, these are pretty substantive uh, 
upticks. And Ryan, I think you just made such an interesting point about the proliferation of progressive prosecutors, even in places like Des Moines. To me, what that speaks to is the fact that in this back and forth, people are deeply frustrated with the way both political parties are handling crime, whether it's bail, um, whether it's the way we treat nonviolent drug offenders, whatever it is, there's, there's massive discontent with that. And then there's also discontent with these policies that ha have maybe decreased deterrence um, at the same time, or even just policies that have destroyed the, the sort of social capital in areas that make violence more common. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think the, the reaction to the progressive prosecutors and the progressive po prosecutors themselves, the combination of both of those two things speaks to a really deep-seated uh, disenchantment with the political establishment. Yeah, and I, I think if we continue to see an unraveling of the social fabric, that you probably can't, you know, hold hold up a progressive prosecutor movement much longer because, the because of the way that you know basically that crime crime is covered and the way that people think about crime. You know, a progressive prosecutor isn't going to get credit for a a crime that didn't that that didn't happen. A recidivism that didn't you know you know that, that's just how human nature is. You're not you're not getting credit for things that don't happen and. When, when you when you do see the crimes, oftentimes it's recidivism, and so you know the media will be able to point to, uh, look, this this person was previously charged with X, and yet and here they are, uh, and the implication is, you know, that if a prosecutor had just locked him up and thrown away the key, then this particular person would not have assaulted, raped, or killed you know this particular victim, and once and once you put particular names and faces on it, that that changes the the, pol the politics of it when you know you you, you know, when you know e even even if you can throw statistics and studies at people showing that this approach will actually reduce crime overall you say well this particular person was still killed by somebody who wasn't charged with enough and so therefore we need to throw more books at more people yeah um yeah in in again like the big picture here is that all of these uh, upticks are happening in the context of COVID lockdowns. So speaking of the political mm -hmm. establishment, um, COVID lockdowns led to job losses, led to all kinds of instability uh, culturally and politically. And these upticks are happening in major cities in the context of the lockdowns and the response to COVID. And I, yeah. I think that's absolutely worth remembering. Um, Ryan, any final thoughts on that? No, you're right. It's, it's a massive social breakdown and mm -hmm. people are People are furious and lashing out at each other, yeah. and, and and that's across the board. You know, whether you have a progressive prosecutor or not. And, and you know, I think the good news on that, uh, to the extent that there's a silver silver lining, is that social breakdown is something that can be acknowledged and uh, hopefully dealt with, even if it's piecemeal. Um, by people on a bipartisan basis. I don't know if that'll happen, um, although I do think you see more momentum for it as demands for solutions uh, with this two -sided, the, the two sides of this coin, uh, progressive prosecutors backlash to progressive prosecutors. So people just want solutions. They don't care if it's Democrat or Republican. Um, so on that note, thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Rising Fridays. Ryan, you're really safe up there in Vermont this weekend. <laughs> Yeah, social yeah, so, social capital still strong in in Vermont. People are people are not as furious at each other up here as we are in the rest of the country. And apparently, you have good beer. Although uh, the beer I had I in do. Vermont recently was was impressive to me, but I don't like IPAs, and, and you do. <laughs> well, then, they, yeah, this is not the place for you then. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. Well, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content. And for those of you who like to listen while on the go, we're also available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Now, uh, I'll also just say, I, as, a, as somebody from Milwaukee, that's, I feel like that's where my preference uh, against IPAs. I, I'll, I'll take a good you, glass you were, of champagne. You were ruined. Yeah, you were ruined by uh, Milwaukee beer. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, ruined by Wisconsin, ruined by the, the champagne yeah. of beers, which is, is generally my preference <laughs> in, in any uh, context. But on that note, hope you guys all have a great weekend and stay safe. And we, as always, really appreciate you turning, tuning in to another edition of Rising Fridays.